The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. I am very pleased to be here today and to present some of the things we have been doing in Switzerland over the last year, so in, in Europe in general. This session is about chloride limits or thresholds or the critical chloride content or whatever one might call that, specifically for concretes with some supplementary cementitious materials. Now my presentation, which is the first, addresses primarily the issue of chloride limits and the concept of this. So the question of this presentation is not really about supplementary cementitious materials, but about the conceptual approach of specifying chloride limits or thresholds. So the question is, can this approach provide the answers we need in making sure that structures have a certain service life and so on? So the concept at the moment and also in the past has been to predict the chloride ingress over time. So you can see that's the time, that's the chloride concentration at a certain depth in the concrete and with a different approaches, different models or measurement methods, it is and was possible to measure or predict how this chloride concentration at a certain depth in the concrete increases over time. And then if we know at which chloride concentration we will get corrosion, this permits to predict the time to corrosion. So this is then called the initiation stage, the stage when not yet any corrosion is going on, but after that point here, corrosion will start and the damage will continuously occur at the rebar level. So that's the conceptual approach. And if we look into the literature, the current state of the art permits to predict chloride ingress depending on the number of parameters such as the cement type, the water cement ratio, porosity, exposure conditions and so on. We know that these influence chloride ingress and we can fairly reliably predict chloride ingress for these different parameters. Now it was always believed that the same can be done also for chloride threshold values, that a different chloride threshold value could be specified for a different water cement ratio, for a different cement type and so on. But if we examine the state of the art, we have to admit that this has failed it was never possible to really establish such correlations and we currently do not know that a certain water cement ratio has a certain chloride threshold value. So this presentation here will give you a brief overview over the last 60 years of experience with this parameter. Some literature data will be shown. I will also very briefly address some issues with accelerated laboratory testing. I will present some recent field data from Switzerland and then I will show the implications this has for service life modeling. And then once this is presented, we can think of if we can apply the concept of the critical chloride content also to non-traditional cementitious materials. So measuring the critical chloride content, this has been a question which arose in the middle of the last century. And if you collect all the literature, this is a graph from a, a literature review published in 2009. So you have all different authors of studies here, and that is the total chloride by binder weight, which is believed to be the chloride threshold value from all these different studies. And you can see there is a huge scatter in the literature. Actually, if you look at the scatter from laboratory studies for Portland cement, you can see that corrosion in some studies started at almost zero chlorides, and in some others, it didn't even start at 3% chloride by cement weight. So you can get whatever you want from the literature. If we only look at field studies with samples exposed in the field or with samples taken from structures, this gather is reduced a little, but still it spans a huge range. Now one explanation for this is that the method used to determine the critical chloride content has a very strong influence on the result. I have highlighted three different studies here. They had studied comparable systems, Portland cement, or the cement ratio around 0.5, and you can see they get totally different results because 
these authors used very different laboratory methods. So unfortunately, the method seems to influence the result more than some parameters on the study. And that is not very good. If you think of how many parameters you can modify when you design a laboratory setup, it really is not very surprising anymore that some of these parameters may strongly influence the outcome. So I have just picked two examples of parameters that you can change in designing experiments. For instance, what type of reinforcement steel to be used? Well, you can choose smooth and polished steel, or you could use smooth but sandblasted steel. You could use ripped steel, sandblasted or slightly pre-rusted or heavily pre-rusted, and all of them will yield different results. The advantage of these here is, of course, that they provide more reproducible results, which some consider an advantage. But on the other hand, they are not very practice-related. And there is no straightforward answer to which of these steel surfaces or geometries one should use when testing for chloride threshold values. Another important issue about accelerated testing is how do you detect corrosion initiation? There is a wide range of electrochemical methods that could be used, and all of them differently influence the outcome of the test. There is also, in the early days, visual inspection and weight loss measurements where those used primarily, and they also provide totally different numbers. So it's also here, it is not straightforward to pick the right method and to know which one will provide the correct chloride threshold values. We have seen this over the last years in Europe in one of the RILEM committees, which had the aim to devise a test setup for chloride threshold values, and we had lots of discussions also about these test methods here to detect corrosion initiation, and hardly any agreement could be reached. Some could be reached, but still it's not straightforward to pick the right method. So to sum up, there are even many more parameters, but I think this is enough to show you that there is still no agreement on a reliable laboratory test procedure for chloride threshold values. And as long as we don't know how to measure it, there is little wonder that any literature data will scatter strongly. Because, and I would like to say that again, because the method itself has a, sometimes a stronger influence on the result than the parameter under study. And that should not be the case, of course. So now I would like to show you some recent results that we obtained on a Swiss structure. It was from a tunnel. This is a tunnel right south of the Gotthard Road Tunnel. Maybe some of you, if you cross the Alps from the north to the south, many have to take the Gotthard Tunnel. And then the tunnel right next to that one is this tunnel here. And we had access to it when doing condition assessment. So from the upper part of the tunnel, we could take cores, drill cores from a very small surface area. It was one to two square meters. And with, from within that area, we took 21 concrete cores. And each of these cores contained a piece of reinforcing steel. So these cores were then taken to the laboratory. You can see they have a diameter of 150 millimeter. And there is always one reinforcing steel bar embedded centrally in the core. And we made sure by condition assessment methods that these bars did not yet corrode at that moment. So what is the advantage of doing this? Well, you have reinforcing steel bar in the concrete, and it is a real surface, totally practice-related steel surface. It has a microstructure as that steel in that structure has, so it's no laboratory steel. And also the concrete that we tested here is mature instead of young labcrete. It is 40 years old in that case, and it is absolutely real concrete. And one of the most important factors here is that the steel concrete interface is a real one, because this has been shown to strongly influence the value you get when testing, and it is very difficult to mimic realistic steel concrete interfaces in the laboratory. So by taking samples from a real structure, we were able to ensure that we indeed get real conditions, material-wise. So in the laboratory, these samples were then coated with an epoxy resin, shown in blue here on the lateral faces. An electrical cable connection was made to the steel, and also the bottom face was coated laterally to avoid chlorides going directly to the ends of the rebars. Then chloride 
could enter only through the white area here. So they were exposed to chlorides by placing them in a salt solution. There was also a reference electrode and the potential was locked over time. And then we used this criterion here to detect corrosion initiation. This criterion is kind of one of the few agreements that we were able to reach in RILEM Committee TC235 CTC over the last years in Europe. It means that corrosion is believed to initiate as soon as the potential drops by at least 150 millivolts from its initial passive level and that the potential stays on this level for at least 10 days because then we can make sure that we don't detect corrosion too early. If you measure potentials of steel and concrete, you will always see or often see that corrosion initiates, but that it is able to repassivate because there is not enough chloride yet there to provide stable pith growth. So with this criterion, we made an attempt to ensure that indeed stable pith growth has been established once this point here is reached. Now these are the results. You can see the chloride content in these concretes after exposure to salt solution, and you can see the cumulative probability for corrosion initiation. We tested like 20 samples, and not all of them initiated during the time of testing, but each point here represents one sample. I also include in the graph the data by Vasi, who measured chloride threshold values on British bridge decks in the 80s, and you can see that the data is not too different. So both of these are field values. And interestingly, at a chloride content of around 0.4% by mass of cement, the probability for having corrosion is roughly 20%. Interestingly also, at a relatively high chloride content of 1%, still around 50% of the samples are not corroding. So I think that's very interesting. Because this is a quite high chloride content, and it means that only half of these samples started to corrode up to then. I also include some laboratory data shown in blue here. It is quite difficult to find such probabilistic data in the literature, uh, so I have just found two sets of data, the triangles, and you can see that they have a lower scatter, so the variability of these results in the laboratory is smaller than the field data. And that is not very surprising, because in the laboratory it is possible to have more reproducible conditions. But again, all of them, around 0.4% chloride by mass of cement, they have all of them approximately 20% of probability for corrosion. The last line here is the distribution of chloride threshold values used in the FIB model code for service life design. And you can see that it is in fact based on this data here, and you can see that, particularly in the lower range, the FIB model code overestimates the chloride threshold value a little bit. So it is open to you to think of if you like that or not. I won't uh, comment it. So I have now shown some, some data on probabilistic distributions of chloride threshold values, and we can use this now in an example of service life design to show the implications of it. The procedure is quite easy. We have a model. There are many different models to predict chloride ingress into concrete, but all of them eventually need a chloride threshold value as the end point of the calculation. So this is an input parameter we need, and then it provides you the time to corrosion, the time of the initiation stage. Now, in this example here, I will not only introduce the chloride threshold limit, but in particular, its variability, which is known from the data that I have shown before, and then, of course, this will provide a variability in time to corrosion. In this example, I just use a very simple fixed second law approach to predict the chloride ingress. It is not the purpose that all of you understand this equation here, but many, I guess, have seen it before. So this is the chloride concentration at depth x at time t. I assumed that we have negligible chloride content initially in the concrete. I assume a chloride surface concentration of 3%, which is a realistic value. And I assumed that the diffusion coefficient is 10 to minus 12. So what you get then, if you use this chloride threshold value data as the basis, then we have a range of 0.2 to 1.6 chloride by mass of cement, and that directly translates into the time to corrosion 
here shown at a depth of 50 millimeters. And you can see in whatever value you pick, you get a time to corrosion between 10 and 100 years. So if you use this data from the Swiss structure as input, we get time to corrosion of 10 to 100 years. And let us briefly think of the quality of that data. It is taken from one structure, from a very small area, so the variability in the entire structure may be or is likely to be even higher than what we measured in these one to two square meters. And it is used by applying one method. So in contrast to this, if we take literature data, we have different structures, different methods, and so on. So the scatter is even much higher than. My conclusion is that the predictive power of this concept is quite poor. And that is, that has a reason, because if chloride ingress at a certain depth is measured or predicted, it has this evolution versus time. So at later time stages, the increase in chloride concentration is only very moderate over time, and that means that a very small uncertainty in chloride threshold value gives you a high uncertainty in time to corrosion. A very important point here is that this cannot be improved by focusing on research developing even more refined chlorescing rate ingress models. Because this qualitative evolution, that's just a fact. So if you use a better model, you won't change it. So my conclusion here is that the concept of the critical chloride content cannot reliably explain corrosion initiation. If we use this model and this data, we get 10 to 100 years. If you go out and ask anyone on the street, probably you get the same answer. <laughs> So we need a novel concept, and it is obvious now that a lot of important parameters that play an important role in corrosion initiation, they are overlooked in the concept of the chloride threshold value. For instance, the steel concrete interface, cracks and pores at the concrete interface, voids, middle scale, rust layers, and so on. How about the pore solution chemistry, pH buffer capacity, presence of sulfides, for instance? and so on. So I will just, to finish, just show two examples of some parameters that we believe have an important influence and that need to be studied in more detail. We have recently done some tests with uh, reinforcement steel bars from different suppliers in Europe and one from China, and it turned out that most of them had a temperate martensite layer on its surface, and some of these steel bars from some suppliers had a ferrite perlite microstructure. And interestingly, they behave very differently in terms of resistance to chloride-induced corrosion. So the ferrite perlite microstructure still, they had chloride threshold values higher by a factor of roughly two, which is very important, but it is never considered in the current way of dealing with this problem. Another aspect is establishing stable pit corrosion. So if we get pitting corrosion, we have a release of ferrous ions in the pit, and also H+, and both of these species, they move out of the pit, and instead chloride and hydroxide and other negatively charged ions move into the pit. Now, if there is too much hydroxide around, it will move preferably into the pit more than chloride, and the pit can repassivate. And that is something that quite often happens in initial stages of pit initiation. Now, obviously, the release of hydroxide is depending on the pH buffer capacity of the cementitious system in vicinity of the pit, and the release of chlorides is depending on the chloride binding capacity. And both of these strongly are interrelated, and also they are strongly depending on the cement type. So to conclude, I think the concept of the critical chloride content or chloride threshold value cannot reliably explain corrosion initiation. And the predictive power of this concept cannot be enhanced anymore by improving chloride ingress models. Important parameters for corrosion initiation are overlooked in this concept, and I think before applying this current concept to novel materials, we should first understand what really controls corrosion initiation. And I would like to make a small remark here to the New Rylem Technical Committee, which has been established last year, which deals exactly with this question of the influences of certain aspects of the steel concrete interface on uh, corrosion initiation. Thank you very much. <laughs>